Trey and Matt, the South Park guys, I remember them saying that Beavis and Butthead to them was like the blues, which was a really high compliment to me because it's it's that kind of thing where it's just it's the same thing over and over again, but it's good. <laughs> Damn it, Beavis. I remember uh, right before South Park went on the air, actually, Mike took us out to give us advice because he's just that cool of a guy, and. Uh, he, uh, he was sitting there going, well, you know, don't uh, don't let people take advantage of you because <laughs> they're dumb. What's your problem, Beavis? I said stop it. First time I seen Beavis and Butthead would probably be, you know, one night I was falling up out of the studio and I came home and uh, just put the TV on MTV and I peeped it out and I was tripping because they was acting a fool. Shut up. You know what I'm saying? I just was... Tripping off how the two little dudes was acting. <laughs> Warning The following feature presentation is not rated. It contains scenes of full frontal nudity and extreme violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Yes! Yes! <laughs> discretion is cool. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead's characters evolved a lot by doing these music videos because I was just improvising. It was kind of fun. It was like doing a puppet show or something. Just kind of out of boredom with doing these videos and just, uh, I got tired of talking about the videos. Ah, oh boy, I think this video has a message. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the message is, leave. <laughs> I'd started listening to Howard Stern and I remember thinking, okay, you know, I was going into a video record and thinking, oh God, I got to come up with more stuff for him to say and I was just listening to him and I realized that he does this four hours a day and he's just kind of stream of consciousness talking about whatever comes to his mind and it's and it's really funny and he's got these other people around him to play off of and I just thought that's what I should be doing with Beavis and Butthead is just have them let them talk about anything don't talk about the video and, and then it started to become a lot more fun but it's like I always tell them if meat's bad for you then how come it's food <laughs> yeah, really. the fun of a lot of that was that the music videos could provide some of the biggest curveballs of the show, and, and people were surprised often at what the characters said. Sometimes if I have a boner that won't go down, I listen to this kind of music. <laughs> In a way, he really filtered all of the writing through him and did a lot of the writing on his feet. One could argue that Family Guy is very similar in that respect. They would uh, pick a list of videos that they were going to, you know, that they wanted to have in the show or that we wanted to record to. We had advanced notes. We knew what videos we were going to look at so we could sort of prepare ourselves, but nothing was really written down. And then we just came up with ideas and Mike would record them right on the spot. And that was really some of the most fun, I thought. At least we have, like, lots of friends. <laughs> uh, not really. <laughs> Are we healthy? <laughs> Mike could make almost anything sound funny. That's a very hard quality to do. I thought that Mike could make even the lamest line sound funny. He, he could say, butthead saying, make it snappy. And there's just something about the way he said it. And it, you know, it helped a little bit that butthead is a little bit of a lisp. You men want a date. Uh, yeah, we want two of them. And make it snappy. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of how the early music videos started out. They were just sort of observations about what was happening in the video and commentary. Um, what is that? Uh, it's a hoe. Um, yeah, I know, but what's that thing she's dragging behind her? <laughs> <laughs> it sort of started evolving where they almost needed a direction in each video, like a, where an entire conversation could maybe take place for the minute to a minute and a half that was in there. Um, hey, hey but is it normal for the inside of your bunghole to itch? <laughs> <laughs> it's what you think of when you think of like comedy writers working together, just you know, nonstop laughing. It was more like that than when you actually have a, have planned something. These guys seem pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. It's like they kind of remind me of myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You remind me of like Urkel. Shut up, butthead. <laughs> I'm cool. Increasingly, as as the series went on. Mike did start ad-libbing much more and started getting much more comfortable doing it 
And I would say the vast majority of all the commentary in the second half was was Mike ad libbed. You know, maybe a writer would you know pitch a direction, but then Mike would just go off with it. You'd be out in the booth, uh, and you might say something to him, and he might do that. That was always a very funny quality because you'd be sitting there, and he, and and you just go something. Like, um, grease the wheels. And then and then a second later you hear Butthead going, oh, I, I grease the wheels. Yeah, check this out. <laughs> He's teeing off. He's using his woody. <laughs> He's trying to get a bunghole in one. <laughs> Beavis is a complete wuss. He's not good at anything. His mom is a slut. <laughs> I started to uh, do this thing with Beavis where occasionally he would, uh, I think the first one was during a corn video where I had him blow on his thumb and he started channeling a rock critic. <laughs> I figured, like, maybe he had just heard all this stuff. You know, such bands as Pearl Jam, White Zombie, Suicidal Tendencies, and other bands that bear the mantle of You're so-called like alternative sport, rock. Beavis. What is even reminded of Laurie Anderson when she wore curlers? <laughs> this video speaks less to the heart and more to the sphincter. So you see this brilliance, and then Butthead just smacks him out of it right back into being a dumbass. I think Korn would do well to learn more from... <laughs> I think at, at a certain point, too, Mike had seen so many videos you know, what new can you possibly say after you've done 600 music videos, that that's where some of the craziest stuff started coming out, where they were doing new dances, that's where they were playing cards, that's where they were reading magazines, that's where one of them would excuse themselves to go take a dump. I used to love on um, Charlie Brown, the way, whenever they danced, I think it was um, Linus that would do the, you know, shaking his head down like this, and they all had their own dance cycles, and so I wanted to do something like that with Beavis and Butthead, where they have just some dance that they do every time they're dancing. And there was one main one that I've actually seen people do on a dance floor. We ended up calling it the Butt Knocker. <laughs> Butthead spanks it, and then Beavis is just kind of doing a, he's just doing this tightly wound karate thing. I always saw him as he's really tightly wound, and so his dance would be just, you know, his idea of being cool is just some kind of karate move on the dance floor. The latter music video comments became even more subversive because I think Mike was kind of tired of doing it, you know? It's like, oh, what do you say that's new? I should have a name for this kind of music. <laughs> there already is a name for this music, Beavis. It's called crap. I came back from lunch and I was just kind of like, oh, God, how many? We've got to do five videos this afternoon? Oh, God. So I go into the booth and just like, Oh, God, it's Tori Amos. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I had a bad attitude there for a while. <laughs> I'm getting sick and tired of these smart-ass videos where there's, like, you know, college dudes, and they're, like, in the water, and they're, like, you know, <clears throat> being all smart-ass. Beavis and Butthead actually had sort of bull detectors. If something was a little too glossy or a little too packaged, they would reject it. You know, they just knew it. Um, but if something felt authentic, or had hot chicks or explosions in it or fire, they would probably respond to it. But there was even heavy metal that they were aware of was really cheesy. You know, so most people would just assume that they'd blanket, you know, across the board, loved anything heavy metal. But, you know, I mean, as I recall, they slammed, you know, like bands like Halloween. You know? Boy, this is horrible. <laughs> Don't say that, buddy. <laughs> I kind of feel sorry for these guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for the most part, bands were surprisingly cool about it. Um, there was a thing where Kip Winger called somebody at the network, and it was a, I don't know, it was just some girl he knew, I guess, and she called somebody in our department and said, um, yeah, the, you can't use Winger anymore. So then it came back to me in this weird way from somebody working for me. I was like, what, who called you? We can't. Who's saying we can't, you know, so I kind of went to the people above me and said, is this true? We can't do Winger? I said, no. And I once spoke to Kip Winger's publicist, and she told me that, that Kip was very angry. But then, of course, she asked me if she could submit some ideas to the show at some point. So uh, I thought that was pretty funny. Then we kind of went overboard on, on Winger after that, maybe. I, I did want Winger on Stewart's uh, t-shirt. That was, that was important to here? me. Time to party down, dudes. I'm psyched. Hope you don't mind, I brought some buds from the youth group. Wow, you were right, Stuart. This party kicks rear. I think Mike Judge is a 
He's a really big Guar fan. We just had clip videos and they used them. And I remember our, our tour after that, pretty much the whole thing was sold out because we were on that Beavis and Butthead for that little stint. I think a lot of people who worked for MTV really liked Guar, but I think pressure from above was like, oh no, we can't, can't yeah. do that. But Beavis and Butthead and uh, Ricky Rackman at the Headbangers Ball, we were able to still kind of keep a keep a presence on there. Yeah, I think people were surprised at some of their commentary in that Beavis and Butthead were pretty hip to rap. They thought that was authentic and cool. And I think that's another thing that from the beginning of the series, who would have guessed that, you know, Beavis was down with Snoop? Wow, 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 yippee yay, yippee yo, doggy dog is in the house. <laughs> yeah. It was real cool to be on Beavis and Butthead to, to, to especially get the love, you know what I'm saying, that they gave you know, me and my people, as far as with my videos, they never really bashed me or talked bad about me. They was really basically, you know, playing to the effect of being down with Snoop Dogg. So that made me feel good when I was watching the show. If I was watching the show with a whole bunch of people and they happened to throw in one of my videos and they say something cool, or Snoop Dogg's cool. You know what I'm saying? I was like, you know, some cool <laughs> I'm, I'm here with my man Snoop. <laughs> Check it out. <laughs> yeah, and we'll be back with some more of them exciting episodes from Beavis and Butthead on this Marathon hosted by yours truly, Snoop D O Double G on MTV. Yeah, <laughs> Let me have some. <laughs> no way. <laughs> come on, come on, just let me have one bite. Get out of here, dumbass. <laughs> hey, hey, check it out. There's Ozzy. Where, where, where? <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> Letterman was in between shows. I was such a Letterman fan, you know, when I was in college and everything. I mean, he was the man. He, I don't think he liked animation. He used to say about The Simpsons, he goes, yeah, it's good, but, you know, it's just a cartoon. And I remember thinking, just having it occur to me one day, oh, I wonder, I bet Letterman's not going to like it. Oh, geez. Uh, and uh, then I just started hearing these things about, oh, Letterman loves it. I hear that he had mentioned on his show and this and that and you know when he would actually say in interviews that he thought it was a good show that that really helped it was just kind of a nice thing for me because I'm a fan but also it kind of made people who normally wouldn't uh, think to even watch it kind of say oh well, maybe there's something to it we loved it and we appreciated it when somebody like David Letterman would step forward and say hey this is smart this is you know this is clever there's some some stuff going on we're like thank you somebody actually is getting what we're doing so like uh Say hello to our good friend Beavis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be nutty. Uh, <laughs> so, like, this is our uh, top ten list <laughs> from our home office in Butt, Montana. So <laughs> 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 <That was> cool. <laughs> and all these other people started, uh, it, like, saying they were fans or, or saying they liked it, like. Uh, Stephen King, Bernardo Bertolucci really like went out on a limb. <laughs> I'd, I've never seen it, but he was on Leno, I guess, and he said it was brilliant. And, and, and then some critics too that were like Tom Shales and Howard Rosenthal and these kind of big critics. Tom Shales of the Washington Post wrote a glowing review and he was a well-respected critic and one of these people that you would have not expected to, to give us a positive review. And I think that surprised a lot of people. Get the kite, Beavis. Cool. <laughs> when I was doing the this profile for Rolling Stone, I remember that uh, Patrick Stewart, Jean-Luc Picard, was a giant fan of the of the show, and he he happily talked to me not only for the article, but I'd say for about a half an hour afterwards about what episodes I had written and what his favorite episodes were. I was in the studio once and met the guy from. Skid Row, Sebastian Bach, yeah, and uh, he was really nice. Said, oh, I got, I'm a big fan. I got so much respect for what you're doing. It's like, oh, f it. wait till he sees what I just did. It's not like I run into these people that often. I did run into uh, the guitar player from Grim Reaper. He said, uh, oh no, no, it's great, it's great. I said, Those videos were awful. They're they're horrible. You know, and he said, and he actually recommended another one. He said, you know, you should try this one, and yeah, we did. We put, I think we put three Grim Reaper videos. Do something. Grim who? Grim, oh, Grim Reaper, oh, I forget it. it. Everybody wishes they could be as impulsive as Beavis and Butthead, but usually through proper upbringing, you realize that you shouldn't do certain things. <laughs> Beavis, 
That kicked ass. Come on, it's my turn. The point of the show, you know, was the great satirical look at sort of where a lot of teenagers in America were at the time. And, and it really was, I think, a very scathing, very harsh, uh, and, and almost a, a very open your eyes people. And, and you know, now I know Mike en enough to know that there was a lot more behind it, you know, and, and Mike is a, a very good guy and a very cool guy. And he actually, you know, was, was trying to say something, you know, that, that this, this is starting to be our youth. And if we're not careful, this is going to be our youth. Beavis, you hell spawn. Do you know where my credit cards are? <laughs> um, no, sir. <laughs> Positively not. <laughs> Positive. <laughs> <laughs>